second reading today is somewhat unconventional. It's a recording of what is believed to be the last kawaii o'o, it's a bird. Uh, the male of the species in this audio is calling for a female who would usually sing a duet. This is the last known member of the species who is now extinct, calling out with no one left to return his call. That recording is haunting. In the silences, there is the response that the bird is habitually waiting to hear, which never comes. There is the haunting of knowing at that moment that not death as that which is a part of life, but complete annihilation is just on the horizon. And I don't believe it's merely anthropomorphism to hear the existential sadness of the kawaii o calling out into loneliness. At the very least, it's the bird's instinct to expect the return call, but I suspect there's something more. I suspect that the kawaii o feels grief and existential dread. I can't prove it, but I suspect it. In our modern era, we are haunted by the grief of creatures who were once with us and are no longer here. When, uh, when I was a child, my parents used to give me zoo books. They're these little books with facts about animals and they had glossy photos and facts and you know, many folks from my generation will likely remember these small pamphlet-sized books with interesting facts, maps, and tables. Now, I loved these books. I would spend hours organizing them, collecting them by family or genus. I would play games where I was a Siberian tiger or a lemur. And on all of them, there would be this little indicator on the bottom right corner that would say things like endangered or critically endangered. And it got to the point where endangered seemed like a fairly good category to be in. Um, it seemed to be where most of the animals were. I didn't think too deeply about it. I mean, I was seven, what did I know? The amount of conservation education in Colorado schools far outweighs the education of other topics in science. I swear I must have gone to the zoo a hundred times and learned the same lesson over and over. Habitat loss, poaching, other causes, this or that, and the other animal is critically endangered by our activities, or worse, only found in captivity. And so my head was filled with facts that I could hold or let go at will. But the emotional and existential content of the impending loss of so many of our animal kin didn't register. It just seemed to be one fact among many. And now I feel like this continues to be the case. 
The more we hear about the effects of climate change on our planet and the awful pollution to our oceans, the more these facts just become part of our lives. They may periodically call out to us to recycle or to passionately declaim our climate-denying friends that they're deluded, but the full existential weight of these losses eludes us in the soup of routine. Now, there's a word that you may have heard to describe our age. It's the Anthropocene. It is a word that some geologists use to describe this geological age on par with the Jurassic or Cambrian, where the most powerful and pervasive cause of ecological change is humans. Now, geological ages are usually given extremely inexact starting dates. The end of the Crustaceous period was 63 million years ago, give or take a couple million. But if we're in a new geological area, era that started within written, recorded history, when did it start? Now, I like to imagine that should we tell the captains of industry from around the turn of the 20th century that in just under 100 years, humanity would consider itself the leading cause of ecological change, they would be celebrating a great victory of humans over nature. We conquered the rivers, the oceans, the cold winter. We can extract resources at will. This is one reason why this age has been given another name, the capital Ocene, meaning that the biggest factor in ecological change is not necessarily humans in our biological form, but the structures of our society to extract resources to convert them into wealth. In this view, it's not the natural or biological imperative of humans, but a social and political decision made over centuries to ever more efficiently and destructively extract any resource from the earth and convert those resources into abstract and material value. But to go back, when can we pinpoint the start of the Anthropocene? Now, it may seem like an idle or philosophical question, but the answer that we provide to this question colors how we conceive of the meaning of our domination of the Earth. For instance, if we say that the Anthropocene started the moment that we began to settle into agricultural lives, say some 10,000 years ago, where we would plant and sow and engage in the domestication of animals for food. If we pinpoint that as the moment, then what does that say about the subsequent years? 10,000 years starts to seem a lot more like a biological imperative than it does a modern choice. It begins to feel like all of the glorious inventions, thoughts, and meaning that we have made were premised upon our own self-destruction. And theologically, if you believe in a God, it makes us ask if God set us up to fail, having given the earth over to sow and reap. But what if we say it started with Copernicus? <clears throat> Copernicus looked up at the starry heavens with a telescope and the accretion of mathematical knowledge from centuries past. And he made the startling discovery that this planet is not the center of the universe, not even of the solar system. This planet revolved around a sun that was no more special than any of the other stars of the galaxy. Now, for centuries, maybe even millennia before this, Western people saw themselves as the center of a universe that was the sole focus of God, the top of the creation chain and the most meaningful of all the creatures. So what did it mean now to be so disentered, to be a vague chunk of rock floating around another vague chunk of rocks randomly scattered throughout a huge universe with millions of other stars and planets? Was it this feeling of loneliness, of existential loneliness, of being abandoned to float through space alone that led to the imperative to make our own future, to take the reins of the planet, so to speak? Was the Copernican revolution the moment that we first felt the existential dread that presses on us now so heavily? Or maybe we can locate this moment, uh, this transition to a new age, somewhere different, 
somewhere closer to us today. Perhaps it was the moment that we first ignited the, t the atomic bomb. Now, I'm particularly drawn to this moment of history. Every April, the Trinity bomb site in New Mexico opens its gate to the general public to view the birthplace of the atomic age. Trinity is the name of the first atomic bomb. It was tested in New Mexico, and it was named such because it was only one of three developed at the time. So one year I visited, and deep in the White Sands Desert, we camped, preparing for the next morning. The place seemed lifeless, just beautiful snowy sand. But we soon discovered that even here, there were all types of life surrounding us. There were spiders and moths and beetles. There are even a whole group of creatures who turned white like the sand and are found nowhere else on the planet. There's the bleached earless lizard, the, Apa the Apache pocket mouse, the sand treader camel cricket. The desert was filled with secret life. The Trinity site was not. The bomb site is positioned in the middle of a region in the White Sands area known as the Jornado del Muerto, or the dead person's root, and it did seem to live up to that name. Now, the Trinity site itself is a huge blast radius with sand and a special glass that was created in this blast called trinitite because it exists nowhere else on Earth. It's highly radioactive, and in the middle sits an obelisk marking the day and the site of the first detonation of the atomic bomb. And I want to tell you a story about that day. The scientists who created these bombs, they had never tested them, and they had no idea exactly what they would do. So they had a betting pool where they would bet about the likely effects of the test that they were undertaking. The bets ranged from just a complete dud to the ignition of all of the nitrogen in the atmosphere, thus ending all life on the planet as we knew it. The night before the blast, they were very afraid that there were Nazi conspirators who were going to try to sabotage the bomb so that it would fail. So they, signed a young, they assigned a young scientist to babysit the bomb for the night. Now, the bomb was suspended on a tower about 100 feet above the ground, and the scientist sat in a box right next to it. That night, there was a lightning storm, and that makes it all the more frightening to me. Now, we can only guess at what the scientist did that night as he babysat the bomb. Did he sit in fear, read a book, um, daydream about the end of the war? But I want to ask, was it that night, at that moment, guarding that device for the first time, that humanity had an awareness that they could unleash a power strong enough to end all life on Earth? And perhaps even more surprising, they discovered their will to test it out. Was it embodied in that singular will to sit next to what might be the end of everything we have known or loved? I just often think about that day of the Trinity explosion as a day when humanity discovered the deepest wells of its existential loneliness. We were alone on this planet, and our decision could end everything, and our will would allow it. So is it any surprise that a being with the will to risk complete self-annihilation would also shrug at ecological destruction that renders extinct, not just dead, but extinct entire species of so-called lesser creatures? Was this the moment when humans became conscious of what it meant to be made in the likeness of the divine? Or is this the moment when humans killed the divine? 20 years later, humans also did the unthinkable. They, they left this planet and walked on the surface of the moon. For the first time, they stood on solid ground and looked and took in the sight of the entire planet with one blink. For the first time, they credibly imagined a path to abandoning the Earth. And the more I think about this, I think maybe I'm asking the wrong question. 
thinking maybe I should ask, when is it that I first came to realize the existential loneliness that mass extinction and ecological destruction births? When did I first become aware of that vibration of anxiety, of placelessness and depression that vibrate just below the fully conscious surface and which completely and thoroughly infects the world? When did I begin to feel the sadness of our ecological alienation? There's a concept that is becoming more and more well known and it's called ecological grief. I believe that we all have it, but we're not all aware of it. I think it emerges in strange ways in all of us. Perhaps it emerges when we daydream about heading out into the wild without looking back, or when we spend a day with the family at the botanical gardens and we see the bee shove its face into the cherry blossoms over and over and we feel out of place or when a child tells us that it's funny that the word that describes the animal chicken is the same word that describes the food. Sometimes we find it in meditation and we want more than anything just to feel ourselves in the grass. I think for me that moment was hearing the Kauai O'o calling out to nothingness. The grief of another creature not only losing its chance at love, but being the last of its kind. So terribly alone. Until it was not. And now all we have is its grief. Recognizing ecological grief, feeling the enormity of it changes your life. When I express this despair and am told callous things about the relative uselessness of certain losses or the shifting of guilt taking about the dinosaurs and the commonality of extinction or just the exhausted shrug of there's nothing that we can do about it. When I hear all that, I know it's just that the grief has not yet sunk in or that it's just too much to handle at that moment, but it doesn't mean it's not there. Recognizing this emotion at grief as grief is vital. When we recognize grief in others, we do not immediately jump to defensiveness or to solutions. We do not say that it is not my fault that your grandfather died. We express our sympathy and solidarity in that common human experience of love and loss. We, in our best moments, sit alongside each other in our grief. It is seeing this grief, holding this grief, holding each other in this grief that will move us to heal, not only ourselves, but maybe our planet too. And this is not a call to action. It's not a call to do something specific like turn to veganism or trade in your car for a bike. We can leave all that side for a moment. First, we should just take time to feel the grief, to acknowledge it, and to make it part of ourselves. It is only through knowing what is so valuable to us that to lose it would hurt more than we can bear that we create meaningful changes in our lives and the world. This grief exists and it is waiting to be felt. So much of this grief is the feeling of not being at home in the world. The great German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who is considered to be the founder of modernity, his tombstone reads, and I quote, two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe, the more often and steadily we reflect upon them the starry heavens above us, and the moral law within us. I think this is a half-truth, for he is missing the third term, the, synth the synthesis of the divine heavens and the divinity within, and that's the earth upon which all of this divinity can meet. If we forget earth, we lose our connection to both the starry heavens above and the moral law within. 
we become existentially homeless and hopeless. So may we have the courage to hold in solidarity our grief for the planet in peril. And may we hold it with the sparrows and the turkeys and the lizards and the worms and the kawaii o'o. Each of their losses is a loss to our souls, a loss to our earthly family, and make us more lonely on this planet. Let us hold our animal kin in solidarity. May it be so.